research in the humanities and social science, uh, primarily on the Levant region, of course. We are part of the British Academy's international research institutes, known as the BIRI, and we have over 100 different years of uh, presence in the region uh, with organizational offices in Jerusalem, where this webinar is taking place today, as well as one in Amman. So uh, please go to our website, that's cbrl.ac.uk, to see, get a full list of our activities and what we do, including uh, the series on the mandate. So without further ado, I'd like to begin to uh, introduce our speaker today, who's Dr. Gabriel Polly. Uh, Dr. Polly completed his PhD in Palestine Studies in the European Center for Palestine Studies at the University of Exeter in 2020. He previously studied the history of art and literature at the University of East Anglia and Palestine and Arabic studies at Bir Zayt University, while also teaching in the West Bank. He currently works in London in the translation and international development sector. Now, the way this will work today is uh, I will hand the microphone over to Dr. Polly, uh, who will give us a presentation of around 25 minutes, uh, followed by a series of questions that I will sort of warm him up to. And then uh, those of you who are in the audience will be able to ask questions. And uh, we intend to have the whole thing wrapped up within around 75 minutes. And before I finally hand the mic over, I do want to note that uh, Dr. Pauly's presentation today is uh, based on his forthcoming book that will come out from Ivy Taurus Press in, on October 20th. So that's, what is that, a week from now or something? <laughs> and uh, he has, the publishers are, have generously uh, provided a discount uh, that I believe we will be putting in the chat menu on the right of the screen. Uh, and uh, so please uh, get that discount code or whatever you need to be able to order the, the publication itself. And I believe also he has written a recent article for Middle East Eye, uh, which goes through some of the arguments of his book and, um, and whatnot, which will also be placed, the link for which in, in the panel to the right on the, on the chat. So without with that long introduction, uh, Dr. Polly, please take us away uh, for the next 25 minutes and I'll come back and start the questions thereafter. Take care, go ahead, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dolphy, and thank you to uh, the CBRL and uh, for inviting me and having the great honor of um, me giving the first of these presentations in this uh, very interesting series to mark um, the centenary and the history of the British mandate period in Palestine. Um, and I think it's uh, somewhat apt uh, that, that I'm the first as I'm going to be looking at the uh, decades and the century actually before the British mandate period began to investigate how the roots of British colonization and support for settler colonization in Palestine actually stretches way back to um, before 1922, before 1917, deep into the 19th century, um, which is something I'm very passionate about, um, an argument that I'm very passionate about and something that we cannot ever lose sight of, I will argue in the rest of this talk. Um, so yeah, again, thank you to everyone who is here. Um, good afternoon, good evening, um, good morning, wherever you happen to be in the world. Um, thank you for coming along. And I'm very happy to be presenting, as Tofik mentioned, my new book. I'm happy to be doing it in front of this audience and at least on some virtual sense to be doing it in Jerusalem, Al Quds. Uh, it means a lot. And I very much hope that in the future, I can come to Jerusalem, come to Palestine and um, discuss my book and anything else in person in Palestine. Um, but this is a great start uh, to be here with you today. Um, so I want to also preface my talk by saying that there are a few um, quotations I will give in the talk uh, from Orientalist Victorian texts um, 
which I've chosen because they demonstrate the racist and orientalist mindset of British travellers, and therefore that's the kind of language that they use um, that some of you may rightly consider to be offensive and racist. Um, I, of course, no, in no way condone that language, but I just, just want to give a warning that I some, some things I say may be offensive. Um, Okay, so I'm uh, to, to talk about the genesis of my book, which uh, the cover of which is displayed on the right hand side. Um, I would also like to thank the designers at IB Taurus who did a great job. And in case you're wondering, that is a travel poster from a French travel company. I believe it was produced around the turn of the 20th century. Um, so within the period that I'm looking at. Um, so yes, the genesis of my book um, came just before I started my PhD at the University of Exeter, when I was attending a lecture given by the person who would become my PhD supervisor, Professor Ilan Pape, who I'm sure needs no introduction to any of you. Uh, discussing the history of Palestine, Ilan mentioned the vast number of Western travelers who made their way to the Holy Land in the 19th century and the vast body of texts in which they recorded their impressions and experiences. To give a sense of the scale of this genre of literature, bibliographic research has indicated that there are at least about 6,000 works on Palestine and Egypt published in Europe from about 1800 to around 1914, um, possibly many more. Um, and in this lecture that Ilan gave, he mentioned that this was a very underutilized resource um, on which very little research had been carried out, even though it was such a vast and important body of literature. The reasons for this lack of research and lack of investigation um, might appear to be self-evident. The work of Western travellers as a whole is generic in the extreme, rife with Orientalist prejudice and cliché, and devoid of genuine insights into Palestinian society, as travellers generally had very little contact with Indigenous Palestinians, could not speak Arabic, and usually passed rapidly from place to place, traversing whatever parts of the Palestine they were visiting in a few weeks at most without taking the time needed to obtain beyond a surface impression. Most travelers were also essentially uninterested in the Palestine and Palestinians of their present day, except in so far as they considered them illustrations to the biblical text. What they really sought on their journeys was the ancient Holy Land. And in their books, they might spend several pages eulogizing on a few scattered stones, which seemed to them to be the remains of this or that town mentioned in the Bible, while devoting only a few lines to the existing village, maybe meters away from those ruins, and what one British traveler called the crowd of brown skinned simpletons who lived there. So to learn anything much about Palestinian society, we have to turn to a fundamentally different body of sources, records largely written in Arabic or Ottoman Turkish from the late 19th century onwards, journals and newspapers produced by the emerging Arab intelligentsia in Palestine. Yet Western sources do have an importance of their own. It is their very generic nature, their prejudices, what they choose to focus on and what to exclude that makes them significant as evidence for what Westerners, particularly the elites who could afford to travel to the Eastern Mediterranean and afford to purchase and could read the travelogue accounts, were thinking about Palestine. These are the attitudes that existed in Britain in the decades running up to Britain's invasion and occupation of Palestine during the First World War, the fateful Balfour Declaration of 1917, and the British Mandate period that directly preceded and paved the way for the 1948 Nakba. My research led me to believe, as I argue throughout Palestine in the Victorian age, that it was the mid to late 19th century that the occupation and settler colonization of Palestine was first planned, not initially by Zionist Jewish individuals or organizations, 
but rather predominantly by British Victorians, many of them evangelical Protestants, with what we would today recognise as a Christian Zionist view of Palestine. And here on this slide, we have some illustrations that I believe, um, these are typical illustrations um, from a series, Picturesque Palestine, that was published in the 1880s, that uh, show the, um, the kind of concerns and the lens that travellers came to uh, when they arrived in Palestine. So we see ruins, um, I believe at Sebastia on the right hand side, um, and the Galilee in the middle, um, and Jerusalem as well on the left, but portrayed um, with these kind of crumbling stones and um, population of beggars in this kind of Orientalist vision of what uh, Palestinian cities were rather than the reality. So the context of my book is a phenomenon which has been described as the peaceful crusade a very euphemistic term, which under the weight of its contradictions eventually resolved as an open violent crusade, the conquest of Palestine by the British Empire in 1917 to 18. The heyday of the peaceful crusade equates with the period roughly covered in my book, from the Egyptian occupation of Palestine in the 1830s, which ended in 1840 when the British Navy helped the Ottomans to recapture the Eastern Mediterranean, to the 1880s, when relations between the Ottomans and the Western European powers began to become more hostile. There were two closely connected sides to the peaceful crusade. The first might be characterized as one of high international relations, the Ottoman Empire was, as I'm sure you're all familiar, thought by the other European empires to be the sick man of Europe. Britain, France and Russia all expected the imminent collapse of the Ottoman Empire and sought to hasten this demise, through sometimes through consular and missionary activity, other times through more overtly violent methods like direct war or proxy war and to strengthen their own positions to absorb Ottoman territories into their own. For, for both symbolic reasons, Palestine as the wellspring of the Christian faith, and geostrategic reasons, even before the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, Palestine was of key importance to the route from Europe to India, all the imperial powers competed over the Holy Land. This can be seen today in the architectural fabric of Jerusalem with the Anglican church, Christ church, uh, near Yaffa Gate uh, in Jerusalem, the first Protestant church in the Middle East, which was essentially a missionary base. Um, then you have the Russian compound um, shortly outside the old city, um, which was funded by the Russian Empire. You also have a plethora of French financed Catholic institutions, both inside and outside the old city, etc. Um, all built in the 19th century by these competing uh, imperial European powers. The second aspect of the peaceful crusade, and I want to emphasize that this was very closely connected to this international relations dimension I just mentioned, was socio-cultural. Especially in Britain and amongst the evangelical Protestants in particular, there was an obsession, a cultural obsession with all things Palestine. The evangelical revival in England in the early 19th century created an intensive focus on the physicality of the Holy Land, represented in church stained glass windows, in popular prints, uh, in artworks, etc. Evangelical beliefs also centered on the Jewish people and the restoration, so-called, to Palestine of the Jews, which many in Britain believed, considering their country's imperial hegemony, that it was the British Empire's destiny to achieve. This cultural obsession also included the proto-Zionist novel da Daniel Deronda by George Eliot, uh, which is discussed in uh, Said's Question of Palestine, you may remember. Um, also, the efforts of the prominent politician Lord Shaftesbury, a very well-known uh, proto-Zionist figure in the 19th century, and the Palestine Exploration Fund, 
which was established with Queen Victoria's backing in 1865. As I've already mentioned, there was also the mass travel to Palestine from Britain and elsewhere on the continent as well and in America, but especially from Britain, uh, with the Derbyshire Baptist preacher Thomas Cook beginning his Cook's tours to Palestine and Egypt in 1869, which was the birth of modern tourism to the region. And uh, you see there on the right hand side, a travel poster produced by uh, the Thomas Cook Travel Company. Um, as well as some images on the left hand side, uh, we have uh, an image of Yaffa Gate or Bab al Khalil um, that was turned into a postcard uh, by the Detroit Publishing Company uh, and was, you know, popularly sold in Palestine and distributed in Europe. Uh, and also an image there we have of some uh, Western travelers with their local Palestinian guides having a picnic on the Jordan River. Um, so now that I've established the context of my research and the context, uh, the political and social of the period that my book concerns, I'll briefly explore the chapters of my book to give an indication of the themes that I cover and the arguments that I make. My book moves roughly chronologically through the Victorian period of fascination with Palestine, uh, but also geographically moves around Palestine, showing how the Western gaze fell on the entirety of the land, but also on specific locations, uh, namely Jerusalem, Nablus and Haifa. I begin with the American traveller Edward Robinson, who visited Palestine twice in 1838 and 1852. I'll just draw attention to the fact that uh, among the portraits in the middle there, he is on the bottom left. Uh, I think that Robinson did more than any other individual to kickstart this phenomenon of the peaceful crusade, because his books, especially the 1841 three-volume bestseller, Biblical Researches in Palestine, he tried to bring a semi-scientific rationality to Palestine, which was in tune with the spirit of Western knowledge systems at the time. Of course, you know, thousands of travelers, pilgrims and so-called explorers and uh, various characters had been to Palestine over, you know, the ages um, for, you know, over two millennia. Um, but Robinson's approach was fundamentally different and fundamentally new. Travelling painstakingly from place to place around Palestine, and he really did cover the length and breadth of the land. Unlike most travellers I mentioned, he was actually fairly adventurous and he went to a, a very large number of villages, different locations in Palestine. Um, so Robinson sought to identify contemporary Palestinian villages with biblical locations, using evidence from the sacred text, but also cold, hard logic. He was unafraid to iconoclastically overturn established pilgrimage sites if they did not fit into his criteria. The effect was to really put Palestine on the map, not some distant, almost mythological place, but a physical land that could be traversed, intimately known. And ultimately, although I don't believe that this was Robinson's conscious purpose, could be possessed in a colonial sense. Robinson's biographer has accurately stated that Palestine in the Western imagination had previously been afloat like an island in the sea, almost like a cloud in the sky of fable. But Robinson's explorations left it a part of Asia. While Robinson was a prototype of Western traveller, his work differs from his successors in significant ways. Robinson had a certain respect for Palestinians and could form genuine, if somewhat short-lived, relationships with them because of his travelling companion, Eli Smith, who was a missionary who lived for over a decade in Beirut and spoke excellent Arabic. Robinson and Smith's methodology for traversing Palestine involved finding a local guide from a village who could then accompany them to the next village, providing their indigenous knowledge of the land along the way. Robinson often recorded snippets of daily Palestinian life and interesting conversations he had with his interlocutors. He also noted in some detail the agricultural productions of different parts of Palestine, 
praising the land's fertility and the indigenous farming of the Fedahin. This was in total distinction to many other travelers' accounts, which portrayed Palestine as a barren land with its potential wasted by its inhabitants. Israeli scholars have frequently drawn upon that body of works uncritically as source texts, but Robinson's work provides a refreshing antidote to these biased representations. Yet while Robinson was reasonably fair-minded for a Western Orientalist of the day, it's a very low bar, of course, uh, those whose journeys he set in motion conveyed a much more negative impression of Palestine and ideologically and practically laid the ground for Zionist settler colonization. Two of these individuals were British military officers who went to Palestine in the 1870s as surveyors for the Palestine Exploration Fund. In an 1878 pamphlet entitled The Land of Promise, Charles Warren, who you can see in the top left of those portraits, uh, quite uncannily predicted the policy of the British mandate 40 years before the British occupation of Palestine began, when he wrote that Britain's role in Palestine would be to, and I quote, gradually introduce the Jew, pure and simple, who is to eventually occupy and govern this country. Let the Jew find his way into its army, its law, its diplomatic service, let him superintend the farming operations and work himself on the farms. That's 40 years before the Balfour Declaration that that was written. Warren's colleague in the Palestine Exploration Fund, Claude Rainier Conda, who you can see on the bottom left of the portraits, became an enthusiastic supporter of early Zionism, giving speeches to Zionist organizations before his death in 1910. Considering settler colonialism in Palestine a particular asset to Britain, he predicted that Palestine may become a very important source of corn supply for England if it was under Jewish settler colonization. Uh, this uh, page of portraits there um, on the uh, in the middle, by the way, is uh, taken from Nahum Sokolov's uh, History of Zionism. That's a very early history of Zionism written in 1919. Um, so he's giving all of these figures, all of whom, uh, apart from Robinson, are from the Palestine Exploration Fund. He's paying tribute to them by including their portrait in his book there. Um, and on the left, you see uh, Robinson's arch, which is um, on the uh, eastern, one of the eastern walls of the Haram al-Sharif in Jerusalem, the Al-Aqsa compound, uh, which Robinson believed was uh, evidence of a walkway that went into the area um, when it was occupied by the historic Jewish temples in antiquity. Um, so now to move on to Jerusalem, two chapters of my book focus on Jerusalem. The first of these considers Western travellers' attitudes towards the main holy sites of the three Abrahamic faiths, Al-Haram al-Sharif and Al-Aqsa, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Western Wall. Whereas Palestinian Christians and non-Protestant pilgrims had treated the Holy Sepulchre with reverence as Christianity's most sacred site, most evangelicals viewed the building with contempt. Prominent Victorian novelist William Thackeray illustratively wrote that, and I quote, it's blaring candles, reeking incense and savage pictures of the scripture story made the Church of the Holy Sepulchre for some time seem to an Englishman the least sacred spot about Jerusalem. Many travellers, including Edward Robinson, tried to use scriptural evidence to argue that the site of Christ's crucifixion and burial place could not have been within the old city at all, and suggested various alternative locations, such as the Garden Tomb, which uh, is just a few hundred metres from the Kenyan Institute in Jerusalem, I believe. Um, and just to, to note here that... Um, in the middle, we have the picture by William Holman Hunt, the pre-Raphaelite artist, showing Easter being celebrated in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as some kind of um, chaotic, um, totally anarchic scene, devoid of any spiritual meaning, and just um, a kind of summary of every form of Orientalist chaos you can imagine. Um, um, uh, so, yes, back to um, alternative sites for the crucifixion. 
One Scottish architect, James Ferguson, in the 19th century, even claimed that the Dome of the Rock marked the true crucifixion site, and the dome itself was the original Byzantine church built to commemorate Christ's sacrifice. While this idea might seem outlandish, it actually gained significant traction during the 19th century, illustrating how evangelical attention was being directed towards the Haram al-Sharif rather than traditional Christian sites. My second chapter on Jerusalem centers on James Finn, the British consul in Jerusalem for 17 years from 1846 to 63, his wife Elizabeth Ann Finn, and their project Kerem Afraham, a farm for Jewish laborers which they established outside the old city in the 1850s. And to those of you in Jerusalem, it might be familiar as a neighborhood in uh, West Jerusalem now. The Finns were evangelicals, deeply obsessed by the Jews, and they hoped that the farm which they established, ostensibly to provide relief during the famine-struck years of the Crimean War, would mark the first return to the land of the Jews of Jerusalem and the beginning of the redemption of the supposedly barren land of Palestine. It was in this respect an early model for a settler colonial farm. While the project folded when the Finns left Palestine, the later on, the now widowed Elizabeth Finn reactivated it from her home in London in the 1880s, a time of increased Jewish immigration to both Palestine and Britain as a result of anti-Semitic pogroms in the Russian Empire. With the support of Lord Shaftesbury and other members of the aristocracy and clergy, Elizabeth Finn established an organization called the Syrian Colonization Fund, which raised money to support the Kerem Avraham farm and other sites in the Eastern Mediterranean. It's noteworthy that Elizabeth Finn used an anti-Semitic argument that it was undesirable that Jewish refugees should come to, Pal to Britain, but rather should be sent to Palestine. In a newspaper article, she described the Syrian Colonization Fund as a society which helps refugees to leave England in search of new homes. My history of the Syrian Colonization Fund until its demise after the First World War is the first to have appeared in print in English. Um, on the right hand side, you can see an image of some of those Jewish farmers on uh, Kerem Avraham in the 1850s. And um, incidentally, a link uh, between the picture by Holman Hunt in the middle and the Kerem Afraham farm is that Hunt was one of the uh, donors to the Syrian colonization fund. So, um, you know, as well as being an artist who visited Palestine several times in the 19th century, Hunt was um, a, a pro-Zionist and uh, yeah, he donated to the Syrian colonization fund. Um, so my book has two chapters also that focus more on Nablus and also center on indigenous responses to the peaceful crusade, ranging from resistance to accommodation. All my information is taken from Western sources, yet I try to interrogate these for what we can learn about Palestinians and their reaction to the increasing Western interest and influence in their homeland. So the first of the Nablus chapters concerns an uprising that took place in Nablus in 1856, which I found mentioned in several travellers' accounts and was also heavily reported in British press at the time. The uprising came against the background of the Ottoman Tanzimat reforms, which were viewed with suspicion by the populace for their authorization of increased Western influence across the Ottoman Empire, particularly over Christian Ottoman subjects. The immediate cause of the Nablus uprising was the shooting dead of a local Nablusi man by a British missionary who was traveling through the city. The result was a day of rioting, which was unfortunately largely directed against the small indigenous Christian population in Nablus. Whilst expressed in this negative reaction, I argue that the uprising demonstrated an incipient anxiety towards the Western presence in Palestine, felt by people in Nablus and possibly elsewhere. The second Nablus chapter looks at a very different figure, uh, a Samaritan by the name of Yaqub Ashelabi, who you can see pictured on the right hand side uh, with Charles Warren of the Palestine Exploration Fund. Yaqub had his first contact with Western travellers in the 1840s, 
and afterwards made a long career out of collaboration with foreign visitors to the city. He made himself particularly useful to travelers who wished to buy antique Samaritan artifacts, especially manuscripts of their sacred texts, which he sold without obtaining permission from his community, causing significant tensions among the Samaritans. You can actually see him in the process of handing one of these texts over to Warren there on the right hand side. Um, with the help of his clerical and political backers, he also visited Britain four times from the 1850s to the 1880s and had a short autobiography published, making him probably the first indigenous Palestinian in modern times to have had a book published in the English language. Again, my exploration of Yaqub's fascinating life in Palestine in the Victorian age is the first in-depth exploration of the subject. So my last uh, chapter, content chapter in the book, uh, considers a key figure in Britain's relationship with the Zionist movement, Lawrence Oliphant. Uh, in the academic literature, Oliphant has often been discussed as an eccentric and his support for Zionism framed as part of his religious mysticism. Alternatively, I fit his interventions in Palestine into the 19th century buildup to Palestine's colonization. Um, and I don't see it as, you know, a, an eccentric uh, hobby that Oliphant had, but rather a product of this long period of creeping colonialism in Palestine. Significantly, Oliphant served as superintendent of Indian affairs in Quebec in the 1850s during which he attempted to implement policies of annihilation and assimilation. And this is a fact that's actually been overlooked uh, in all the other literature about Oliphant's activities in Palestine. In 1879, so three decades after his time in Canada, he developed the most complete plan for settler colonialism in Palestine that then existed. After he traveled around the region, he recognized that Palestine west of the Jordan was already, and I quote, in the highest state of cultivation by the indigenous Fellahin. There was no room there for uh, a colony of the kind that he planned. So he turned to what was called in the 19th century Eastern Palestine, which is present day Jordan, where he identified an area of a million and a half acres as a potential site for a huge Jewish colony advocating the ethnic cleansing of the region's largely Bedouin population. He wrote of his belief that, I quote, there would be no difficulty in clearing them out. While his colonial plan failed to win the sympathy of the Ottoman authorities, he settled near Haifa, devoting the rest of his life until 1888 to supporting the nascent Zionist movement. On the left there, you have a map of Palestine and where he proposed that there should be this colony uh, in Eastern Palestine connected by rail. Um, this was before railways existed in Palestine, but uh, which he predicted. Um, and on the bottom right, you can see uh, he actually, Oliphant lived in two places in Palestine. Um, some of you I'm sure are familiar with the German colony in Haifa. There is a house there that Oliphant lived in um, for about 18 months. And after that, he actually moved to a village inhabited by the Druze population, uh, Dalia or Dalia del Carmel, was still there, of course. And um, this you can see there in the bottom right, the house that he built, that he funded and lived in, uh, in Dalia, um, which is actually a museum now um, of the IDF or Israeli occupation force and their Druze um, units. So it's actually like a, some kind of um, memorial to, to Druze soldiers who served with the, the Israeli army. Um, okay, um, I just want to finish my presentation <coughs> with this image, which is um, a screenshot of uh, the website of the Friends of Zion Museum which is an institution in West Jerusalem founded by American Christian Zionists in 2015, which is dedicated to presenting a, a very positive view of Israel. Uh, you can see 
uh, images of Edward Robinson on the left, um, here standing next to, just out of shot, um, Robinson's arch, which I mentioned earlier, um, and dressed in rather ahistorical clothing um, for the 1830s. And uh, Lawrence Oliphant and his wife Alice um, in the middle, and even Queen Victoria on the upper right, giving some kind of very odd, wild gesture. Um, so this museum and this exhibition uh, of these 19th century travellers and uh, Queen Victoria is just one of many ways in which the Victorian legacy has received recognition in Israel for laying the foundations of the Zionist project and of the state. But I think that the most important legacy of this period is that of the concrete plans for settler colonization, up to and including the elimination of the Palestinian native presence, which is what Oliphant theorized. Like so many other injustices the world faces, the situation in Palestine today is to a significant degree a hangover from the era of high colonialism and imperialism in the 19th century, in the decades even before the British directly occupied Palestine and paved the way for the Nakba. Thank you very much. So uh, yeah, please, please uh, come at me with any questions you may have. Gabriel, you can hear me? Yes, Brilliant. Well, I'd like to thank you for a fascinating uh, presentation that you've given us a lot of unique uh, research there and uh, very well presented, very clear with your thoughts there. Uh, so uh, the way this is going to go is that I'm going to sort of try and warm you up with a bunch of questions. Now, I acknowledge quite openly that this is not really my specialized or forte in so far as my, my, my set of academic interests, although I'm vaguely familiar with stuff. So I'm also going to ask our audience members to please put your questions in the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, which can also help uh, us, uh, you know, uh, engage uh, Dr. Polly once I'm done with my warm up here. <laughs> so, uh, with that caveat said, I guess uh, perhaps I'd like to hear a bit more about this this political and cultural and religious sort of context that seems so crucial to to establishing the, the foundations of uh, what would later come in the mandate. Of course, there's the, the in, intrapolitical rivalry that's going on on an imperial level, right? Uh, but there's also this, what you call the evangelical revival. Uh, could you give us a bit more depth uh, into what, what's really going on in these two dimensions? Uh, how, how distinct are they from one another? Uh, how much are they feeding off each other or not? Uh, and and to, so, something to that effect. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um... Yes. Um, so, um, yeah, just to kind of explain, um, I mean, the, you know, the evangelical movement comes about, um, I mean, it's really a kind of return to the austere um, origins of Protestantism. Obviously, you have, you know, in Europe, you have um, the kind of Protestant revolution that kind of sweeps through in the um, 16th century, and then, you know, continues over in, in the 17th century, you have the Puritans as well. Um, and just to kind of link there, um, you know, Oliver Cromwell, who was, uh, you know, the kind of Puritan leader par excellence in Britain, um, you know, ended the centuries old exclusion of Jews in Britain, which had existed for about 400 years, I believe, before Cromwell, that you know, Jews have been expelled from Britain and Cromwell, uh, you know, readmitted them. And one of the, the reasons for that was that, um, you know, he believed that they could be gathered in Britain and then sent to Palestine. Um, so, you know, this is these, these kind of Zionistic or proto-Zionistic uh, Christian ideas existed from the 17th century on. Um, you then have the kind of Enlightenment period when um, interest in Palestine somewhat subsides. Um, and then, you know, it's re reawoken with Napoleon's attempted invasion of Palestine in 1798 to 99. Um, Napoleon also, 
um, you know, has a proclamation um, to the Jews of Palestine that, uh, you know, he will occupy the land and then he will, you know, create a Jewish state in Palestine, which is really fascinating. And apparently, um, you know, got almost no reaction from the Jews in Palestine or outside Palestine. It really was not on the agenda and uh, not something that they cared about at the time. And then, of course, Napoleon was defeated with British uh, help uh, by the Ottomans. Um, similarly to how Britain helped drive the Egyptians out in the 1830s. Um, but yeah, from then on, you, you know, you have the evangelical revival, which is a return to these kind of Puritan ideas um, in which, you know, the Jewish people and the Old Testament actually somewhat takes like a primacy over the New Testament. And um, people, uh, evangelicals at this time, are, are almost, you know, more obsessed with the Old Testament than the New Testament. Um, and it really permeates through English society. I'll say English as opposed to British because, you know, it wasn't necessarily the same in um, other parts of Britain. Um, but uh, it really permeates throughout English society and, uh, you know, it affects it from top to bottom. So uh, an individual that I would, I mean, you know, this is the kind of broader cultural context, but an, an individual that I would say, um, combines those two levels is someone like Shaftesbury, you know, um, who, you know, again, a name I mentioned earlier may be familiar to some of the audience as, um, you know, a kind of key Victorian uh, figure who supported Zionism and was actually um, the first person to say that, uh, you know, uh, Palestine was a land without a people for a people without a land. Uh, it's not his exact wording, but um, he did record that in his diaries in the 1850s, um, that sentiment. Um, so, you know, he was an evangelical. He was known as the evangelical of the evangelical. So, you know, the most evangelical person in Britain involved in multiple charitable causes and so on. Um, also involved in government, you know, was an aristocrat. Um, served in different cabinets, you know, throughout the 19th century. He was very, very long lived. Um, so he was really active, politically active for 50 or 60 years. Um, and, you know, tried at different times to kind of push this um, proto-Zionist agenda. Uh, and um, he was one of the figures behind establishing a consulate in Jerusalem and you know, trying to establish this Protestant mission in Jerusalem, which is based in Christchurch, as I also mentioned. Um, so, you know, that's that's one example of, of the way that this evangelical um, fervor influenced politics and actually moved from just a cultural sphere to a political sphere. Another example that I talk about in more detail in my book is James Finn, the consul in Jerusalem. Um, you know, he was appointed consul in the in 1846 he had he was not from the foreign office he had no political experience at all um you know his all the experience that he had was uh, you know being fluent in biblical hebrew and having done research on on you know the kind of israelites and so on jewish history you know so he was not a diplomat um and yet just with that kind of knowledge and that background, he was appointed consul in Jerusalem and he was officially made the protector of um, the Jews that were in Palestine. Um, so, you know, if you read his diaries and his memoirs, it's full of, you know, Jewish in, uh, residents of Palestine coming into this or that problem. And he became intimately involved in their daily affairs. Um, so, you know, it was it was not consulship uh, or kind of diplomatic representation as we would know it. It was rather some kind of in interference that was driven by his evangelical ideology and uh, his beliefs about the Jewish people. Yeah. Well, thank you for the answer. I, I mean, partially what you're making the case around, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, is that it, uh, well. No, actually, I'd like to hear more, more specifically to what extent you would say that Jewish Zionist political aspirations were influenced and molded by the Christian yeah. Zionist and particularly English Christian Zionist uh, sort of background, context, re religiosities and frameworks. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, my argument, I don't want to be reductionist, um, you know, in any way. And uh, I know that Zionism is, is, I mean, Zionism kind of emerged as a practice in the early 1880s uh, with what's called the first Aliyah, and then as a more political ideology, obviously, with Herzl at the end of the 19th century. But there are, you know, precedents for it that can be found within European Jewish thought, you know. Of course, that's not my subject area, and, and uh, you know, I, I don't uh, take any issue with that. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's very clear um, from the documentation that uh, these evangelical British figures were theorizing settler colonization. Uh, so Finn, the Finns in Keram Afraham in the 1850s, um, and then Oliphant, and you know that that quotation from Charles Warren, which is almost kind of uncanny in the way how it says, you know, Britain will occupy Palestine, we'll bring in the Jews, we'll start putting them into government positions and the military. You know, it's it's almost uncanny. And this was before um, settler colonization had begun. You know, it was before the first Zion, uh, Zionist um, settler colonies were founded, and it was long before Herzl um, kind of you know, pinpointed it in, in his book, The Jewish State. Um, and, you know, uh, Zion, the Zionist leaders at the time openly admitted this. And, uh, you know, Sokolov, who uh, whose work I mentioned there in the slide about Zionism, um, he was later the president of the um, World Zionist Congress, I believe. So, you know, he was a key figure within, within Zionism. Um, but in his book, The History of Zionism, he says, you know, these Christians were, were Zionists um, in every sense of the word, you know, back in the 1850s, 1860s, before the political movement had begun. You know, in every sense of the word, they were prefiguring it. They were arguing for the same things. Um, then, you know, when when you get to Oliphant um, in the 1880s, there is a very clear direct link because he was... Um, uh, in correspondence with Zionist organizations in Europe. And then when he moved to Palestine and became a kind of settler himself, he was, you know, visiting the settlements. He provided them with funding. He used to go and check up on them. He used to give them advice and became hugely influential to them um, and shaping that kind of initial thought. Um, his work was translated into Hebrew and it was read by, you know, leaders in the Zionist movement, The Land of Gilead, which is this book where he talks about not only how a colony could operate, but also ethnically cleansing the population. The, uh, you know, it was translated into Hebrew at a very early stage. It became tremendously influential. Um, so, you know, by the time you get to the 1880s, there is a very clear very, very clear connection. And then later on, people like Conda, you know, giving lectures and giving advice um, to Zionist organizations in London and elsewhere, you know, the connections are, are extremely close and extremely strong. Oh, fascinating, fascinating. Um, I, uh, I wanted to pick up on another uh, dimension where you, you mentioned the three cities of Jerusalem, Nablus and Haifa. And Perhaps some clarification. Uh, those are cities that that, that uh, British Victorians were interested in. I, I was expecting you to say Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and Nazareth, but uh, where where does Nablus and Haifa come in the picture? Um, okay, um, yeah. So I'll, I'll talk more about Nablus and Haifa. Um, yeah, I mean, as as you kind of um, point out. Um, you know, obviously they were interested in, in Bethlehem and uh, Nazareth and around the, the Sea of Galilee and so on. You know, these kind of classically Christian sites and, you know, al almost all travellers that went to Palestine visited all of those places and, and wrote about them. Um, but I think I was more kind of fascinated by, by how they represented Nablus in particular. Um because Nablus kind of stands as like a metaphor for Islam, 
in uh, in their books because a lot of the um, the towns and cities that they visited in, like Nablus, uh, sorry, like Bethlehem and Nazareth and Jerusalem, they had these large non-Muslim populations. They had a lot of missionary activities. They had this kind of um, cosmopolitan Levantine elements. They had other Western people who lived there and were doing kind of missionary work and this and that. So um, there was already a kind of strong Western influence there. Uh, but Nablus was somewhere where there was starting to be this Western influence built up, like I talk about in my chapter with this uprising. Um, there was a missionary school there and um, European empires had their consular agents who were local people, local Nabolsi people who they paid to, to represent Britain or France or, or Prussia. Um, but it was, you know, an overwhelmingly Islamic city and it became, it, it had this kind of reputation as being, a, um, uh, you know, there's one source that describes it as something like the very furnace of Mohammedan bigotry. You know, it, it had, the, there were these kind of very strong Orientalist tropes that developed around Nablus in particular. Um, so, uh, so I think it, it's interesting to consider insofar as a, um, a location which is maybe not being considered in relation to um, the 19th century kind of colonization efforts before. Um, it was also framed as somewhere where um, it was a very fertile part of the land. And Conda had something, um, he wrote something about how Nablus in the event of a British occupation could even become like an administrative capital because it's roughly in the center of Palestine. Um, it was also somewhere that was very often visited because it lay on the road between Jerusalem and Nazareth. So, you know, travelers, all travelers went through Nablus and uh, also stopped off and saw the Samaritans and so on. So it's it's highly covered. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll leave that one there. And then Haifa. Um, Haifa, you know, as um, as I'm sure, you know, you know, well, um, Haifa was um, a very small um, you know, almost like a village um, throughout most of the 19th century until about the midpoint when it started attracting um, kind of internal immigration from Palestine. And then, you know, you have the German colony being built there and, and so on. And it starts to grow. And with travellers from Oliphant onwards, really, they frame Haifa as um, a kind of um, test tube for like, Western modernization in Palestine. And um, Oliphant's second book about Palestine, he wrote two books about Palestine, the first called The Land of Gilead, which is um, a word, the biblical word for Gilad, which is, um, you know, this area of Jordan where he thought a colony could be. His second book was called Haifa, Modern Life in Palestine. Um, so it, he framed it as the kind of only place where modern life was even possible in Palestine because of these influences, the, like the German colony, for example. And um, he wrote a lot about how Haifa would become, you know, which is true, would become the, the main port of Palestine and would become the most important part of Palestine for communications with um, not even other parts of Palestine, but also into Syria and Beledashem more widely. Um, which is also how uh, Herzl thought of Haifa as well. I mean, you know, Herzl hated Jerusalem and kind of viewed a lot of Palestine with contempt. But uh, in his book, um, Old New Land, um, he, he kind of eulogizes Haifa and talks about, you know, there's sails and, and flags of every nation on the, the boats coming in and so on. So another parallel between um you know, how Western travelers viewed it and and how early Zionists viewed Haifa. Gotcha. Fascinating. Thank you. I, I would like to invite the audience uh, to uh, put your questions in the question and answer feature, please, not the chat feature. Uh, and uh, so please, you know, if you're having, if you're stimulated to ask any questions to Dr. Polly, please throw those in the question and answers. I'll ask him a couple more questions uh it's it's great to talk to you very engaging to hear from you so thank you for all that you've said so far uh i was uh, uh struck by uh, in when you gave your presentation when you spoke about uh, the role of the, the palestinian fixer basically and, mm -hmm. and i imagine he comes up or this figure 
sure it was male yeah. mostly. Yes. Uh, can, can you speak more to to the, this role and how much yeah. this figure appears and and what kinds of roles they play? Yes. Um, yeah. So I mean, the the word quite commonly used is a uh, dragoman, um, which okay. has its roots in the Arabic uh, terjaman, which means translator. Um, and, you know, I mean, obviously, these uh, figures were, were key to travelers, you know, um, all in this period, every single Western traveler, whether they came on their own or as part of a group, they needed, you know, local guides, uh, translators, and, um, you know, sometimes, although it wasn't really necessary, because Palestine was by and large very safe, but sometimes they hired, you know, Bedouins with, uh, you know, their, their old rifles to protect them and so on. Um, so, you know, they all rela- relied on, on the indigenous presence to, to get around, to move around, um, you know, and uh, to, to 100% degree. Um, uh, but normally in their books, you know, they, you can tell that travelers did not often form very deep relationships with these people. Um, you know, sometimes they're not even mentioned, you know, you, one knows that they were there uh, because they might be mentioned, you know, once or twice, you know, uh, Dragoman helped us with so-and-so. But normally, you know, they almost become in, invisible in the texts. Um, and I know that, you know, there has been some other really great work published about Dragomans. Um, uh, I would, yeah, just like to highlight um, Robinson's um, kind of usage of Palestinians. I did mention it there. Um, the way how, you know, he would go from village to village and um, find someone in the village to, to help him, to guide him, because he recognized that their knowledge of the land, um, not, not necessarily of the whole of Palestine, but in definitely in a good kind of distance circumference around their village was very great. Um, sometimes he would even, sometimes even the Mukhtar of the village, the leader of the village would offer to show him uh, around and travel with him for a kind of day or two, um, which is quite kind of quite touching and nice. Um, and uh, I would I would actually recommend anyone who is interested in kind of what Palestine looked or uh, felt like to have a look through Robinson's biblical researches in Palestine. It's the actually the only book I would rec- recommend from the entire 19th century of Western literature. But uh, yeah, there's there's some interesting things in there. Um, and then secondly, I yes, uh, I think. Uh, maybe you were referring to the Samaritan um, Yaqub Shalabi there, who um, was like an exception to the rule um, of the Palestinians becoming invisible in the text, because I started to find mentions of him from different travelers. You know, they would all, they they tended to call him Jacob Shalabi. Um, you know, but, I mean, obviously his, his real name was Yaqub. Um, uh, so he was an exception to the rule. He was a very colourful character. He was kind of very interesting and would feature in their text often. And then he had this yeah, short autobiography of himself that was published in London as well. Um, so, yeah, a fascinating character um, who kind of made his fortune through selling off Samaritan manuscripts. And uh, you, there's museums around Britain and Europe and so on that you can find items that, that were obtained through him. Um, so yeah, th- there was this kind of craze for collecting Samaritan manuscripts, um, in the 19th century, uh, but also travelers would kind of denigrate him. They would, uh, turn against him. I think, uh, in my book, I kind of describe it as they consider the fact that he was quite an enterprising, you know, businessman, they would say, ah, oh, you know, we're corrupting the Palestinians. Look at how, you know, this, this Samaritan is becoming corrupt and greedy and he's selling us fake manuscripts and so on. But that was entirely as a result of their, their own obsession and desire to collect manuscripts. Um, so I found that particularly fascinating. Very interesting. Thank you. So I'm going to transition to some of the questions that have been coming in. Uh, we have a couple here, so uh, I'll just uh, go off the top here. Jack Skelton Wallace asks about, tell, can you tell us something about the number of religious hospices? I'm not sure why his interest in hospices, but uh, maybe that. Um, 
Okay, I mean, yeah, not necessarily my uh, kind of forte, but um, all I can say is from the accounts that I've read, um, I mean, all of the monasteries around Palestine. So obviously, uh, you know, non-Protestant institutions, you have Catholic, you have Orthodox, Armenian and so on, um, would have places for travellers and pilgrims to stay. Um, sometimes travellers did stay in those, um, Western travellers. Other times they wanted to avoid them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's quite often that travellers would prefer to sleep in tents. I should say that their tents are extremely comfortable. Like they used to bring carpets and chairs and have these kind of huge tents that, that it took kind of entire teams of, you know, Palestinian workers to walk around Palestine with on, you know, horses and donkeys and whatnot um they would often prefer to stay in these institutions in these kind of setup rather than go into the monastic institution because they somehow felt that if they went into these non-protestant um you know catholic or orthodox environments they would be corrupted and the priests would try to kind of indoctrinate them and, and so on um, but obviously, you know, they they provided a hugely important service to, um, you know, pilgrims. And uh, at this time, there were no, uh, uh, later on, there were kind of Protestant, more Protestant churches were built. And you have, I think there's the uh, Scottish Episcopalian guest house in Tiberias and, uh, you know, these Protestant institutions that travellers could go and stay in often also served as hospitals for local people and so on. But this is kind of before then. So your choice was either to stay in your own tent or to to go into a monastery. But that would be at your peril because, you know, those pesky priests might try to uh, try to influence your view of the Holy Land. <laughs> yeah. OK, so uh, I will. <laughs> Jump to the next question. Um, this one from Philistine Naili, I guess, uh, who thanks you very much for a fascinating presentation. Uh, and, and I presume she looks forward to reading the book. Uh, the question uh, revolves around the issue of the use of the term proto Zionist, which you use several times in your presentation. And she asks, is it not delicate to use this term for millen millenarist Christians who pri whose primary preoccupation was the, was the pre preparation of the second coming of Christ, facilitated by the, quote, return of the Jews and often even their conversion? Good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, of course, um, there is a, there's clear difference between um, the ideology that lay behind um, the kind of motivations for people like um, James and Elizabeth Finn and, and other um, who I know Palestine uh, knows a great deal about already. Um, and, uh, you know, other other individuals like Shaftesbury and so on. There's clear differences between their uh, the, the motivations that lay behind their activity and um, the motivations that lay behind um, early Zionist and Zionist Jews. Um, just as today, there are differences between Christian Zionists who, who also have this, you know, millenarian ideology, which uh, for those of you who, who don't know, is just about fulfilling biblical prophecy, the return of the Jews, their conversion to Christianity, the apocalypse and, and all of that. Um, so, you know, Christian Zionists sometime um, you know to, to a greater or lesser degree may still have that those ideas but we still call them zionists as well we would you know preface them with um with uh, the word christian and it's important to say that there are differences in, in in an ideological sense although i i found that the kind of in the practical side um you know there were there were not so many differences and the way that the finns um kind of theorized and then developed their farm, Kerem Afrahan, um, evolved along kind of similar lines to later Zionist settlements. And although they were millenarians themselves and um, had this kind of fantasy about the conversion of the Jewish people, they ensured at the Kerem Afraham farm that they, they didn't uh, they didn't try to convert Jewish people because they know that that would uh, just alienate their potential um, their potential laborers you know um, 
So there were there were kind of similarities. And then by the time you get to the 1870s and 80s, um, the, the millenarian ideas are being expressed less and less by British travellers. Um, so in his book, Land of Gilead, Oliphant even raises that. Um, he says, you know, some people out there have said that I'm an eccentric and that I, you know, have these beliefs, which were even recognised as being a bit wacky at the time, some of this kind of excessive belief in millenarianism. He says, you know, I. some people have said that I'm only kind of concerned with Christian prophecy and so on. And then, you know, he says in his book, um, I can't quote the exact words, but, you know, to, the point is that he says, I may hope for that, you know, I may, I may desire that, but it's not the reason why I'm doing this, um, you know, and it, it was moving away from that millenarian viewpoint towards, um, you know, clo close towards the actual practices of settler colonialism as it evolved from, from the first alias. So there was absolutely an ideological uh, difference. And I would use, I would say that the term proto-Zionism indicates that it's not Zionism as we exactly know it. You know, there is something different there. Um, but uh, it was moving closer and closer towards it during the period under discussion. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. So the next question uh, comes from Jacob Scott, who also thanks you for a great paper. It's not just a paper, it's a book. So, <laughs> and I remind the audience that they can get a discounted copy order. What, by, by, you can see in the chat, uh, I get a discount code there and find this. The book is actually coming out on 20th of October from IB Taurus. But uh, so, uh, you can do that after the after you hear this question from Jacob Scott, which basically asks, can you comment further on how <clears throat> the anti-alienism slash anti-Semitism at the turn of the century interacted with the more romantic Victorian evangelical notions of Britain, quote, returning the Jews to Palestine? Interesting question. Um, yeah, wow. Okay. Um yeah, they're deeply interconnected. Uh, they're deeply interconnected. And those individuals that, um, I mean, I think probably the two most well-known, um, if we go from the kind of 19th, 19th into the 20th century, the two most well-known British, um, you know, kind of non-Jewish Zionists, we have Shaftesbury, and then of course we have Balfour. And, uh, you know, both of those exhibited these anti-Semitic uh, prejudices. So Shaftesbury, um, you know, voted, he was in the House of Lords, he voted against um, extending full political rights to Jewish people uh, in Britain. Um, and Balfour also, um, when he was prime minister, you know, 12 years before the Balfour Declaration 1905, um, you know, drafted the, uh, the Aliens Act, I believe, um, which was trying to, prevent the the entry of Jewish people into Britain in uh, at the time of also the time of pogroms and intense um, anti-semitic attacks against Jewish people when when they needed a place of refuge um, so it's really there and uh, it's really there uh, and I mean I, I do look at this most closely in my my chapter on Kerem Avraham. Uh, and in particular, the later years, so when it was being administered by the Syrian Colonization Fund, um, that they were holding these meetings and so on, um, up and down the length of uh, the United Kingdom, fundraising meetings, etc. And uh, we have, you know, reports of those um, in the press. And uh, it's really fascinating to see the way that uh, anti-Semitism was we weaponized in order to raise funds uh, for getting getting Jews out of Britain. And there's actually one report um, where uh, it was a report of a public meeting in London where there was a vote taken during at the end of the meeting where there was you know this house is in favor of a uh, jewish settlement in palestine and uh, it was recorded that the one person who actually spoke against this motion uh, who was in the audience was um 
a Jewish person who said, you know, where does this where does this leave the rights of Jews in Britain? You know, I mean, you're talking about sending sending uh, my co-religionists to Palestine, but uh, you know, what about me as a British Jew? Like, what does this mean for me? Um, so that it, if anything, the the opposition to these uh, ideas came from from Jewish people, and it was Christians who were more more into the idea at the time. Gabriel Polly, it's been a fascinating discussion today. Uh, our topic has been the Victorians in Palestine, laying colonial foundations. It's a book coming out on 20th of October from IB Taurus. Uh, if uh, you've had the opportunity to listen to this webinar, you certainly have had a lot of food for thought and uh, plenty of juicy details that you can find a lot more of in that book. Today's webinar has been brought to you by CBRL and is the first in our series uh, this autumn, uh, focusing on the centenary of the British mandate over Palestine. The first event was this one, and the forthcoming event is coming up on Monday, the 17th of October, Thirsty Water Carriers, The Legacy of Colonialism in the Galilee by Dr. Muna Dejani. Uh, please check out our website, cbrl.ac.uk, where you can find the full program of this series of lectures, as well as all other events and activities that are run by the Council for British Research in the Levant. My name is Tofik Haddad, I, and this webinar has come to you from Jerusalem. Uh, folks, have a great night, uh, and thank you very much to Dr. Gabriel Polly for this fascinating discussion and his great work thank you. Uh, and research. And I'm sure I speak for all the audience there. So have a great evening and good night.